have the great privilege to be the head of school here at Phillips Academy, and I am thrilled to see so many people here with us in Cochrane Chapel, a full house tonight for this wonderful event, which is a partnership between us uh, here at the school at Phillips Academy and a wonderful group of people at the Andover Historical Society and the town. We couldn't be happier about the chance to come together tonight around this important set of topics and to welcome two terrific guests in Rick Burns and Drew Faust. Um, so I want to first to start with a few thank yous and then a few brief intros and then I'm going to turn it over to the stars of the show. Um, a few particular thank yous. One in the front row, uh, Michael Morris, class of 1986 here. Michael Morris Jr., well known to many in the community. Um, you may not know this, but he is an avid Civil War buff. This guy knows a fair amount, a huge amount about the Civil War. Um, this event was Mike's idea last spring as part of the Lest We Forget series that we're in the midst of here in the town of Andover. Um, and Mike, I'm so grateful to all of the spam emails you sent out to everybody you know to get people here and all the great work you did. So thank you. Um, to Elaine Clements, our Executive Director of the Andover Historical Society, thank you for your leadership in this event. Um, to Carrie Madura, the Andover Historical Society's uh, Program and Public Relations Manager. Uh, to Jane Cairns, President of the Board at the Andover Historical Society. Um, thank you to all the board members and all those who have contributed to this event. Uh, and then finally to Buzz Stepchinski of the town of Andover, our town manager, for his support of this event. So please join me in a round of applause for this wonderful team. doing this with the town, I also have some amazing colleagues here at Phillips Academy who have worked tirelessly on this event, and I want to thank them as well. Um, in particular, uh, Gail Ralston, who is both on the board of the Andover Historical Society and works here at the chapel, as well as uh, a few people in the head of school's office, Nancy Jetton and Belinda Trav. In particular, thank you to the wonderful team here for all you've done, and to our AV team and everyone else who has worked on this event. Thank you. I suspect many of you know this, but we're in the midst of a year-long discussion series and uh, in its way, celebration, commemoration of the role of the town of Andover in the Civil War. Um, it's hard to say celebration because of obviously the uh, terrible events that took place, but also um, I think it is important to note the important role that this town played um, and Phillips Academy played in the Civil War and its outcome. Um, think back to the time of the Civil War, the population of the town of Andover was about 5,000, so much smaller than it was today. Um, you could imagine the effects of 716 Andover men enlisting, many in what would become the first Massachusetts heavy artillery. Mike Morris, you should be doing this intro because you would do much more justice to it than I will. Um, of those men who went into battle, 92 to 100 of them lost their lives in battle from a combination of disease and in prisoner of war camps. Nearly every family in town was affected by this loss. Um, and it's important, I think, to put in context the fact that the losses in Andover mirrored the losses in much of the United States at that time, which was to say roughly 2% of the population being lost. And we'll hear much more about this in, uh, in context. So to tell us much more about this and to introduce uh, an extraordinary film, uh, we have two uh, guests tonight here at Phillips Academy. Um, the first is Rick Burns, who is uh, immediately to my right. Rick has been at writing, directing, and producing historical documentaries for 20 years. He has uh, received numerous awards, including seven Emmy Awards, the Christopher Award, the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award, and Producer of the Year Award from the Producers Guild of America. And uh, importantly, he created Death in the Civil War, a two-hour documentary which many of you watched here on campus uh, on Sunday based upon President Faust's book. And to Rick's uh, right is uh, President Drew Faust. Uh, President Faust was my boss at Harvard uh, University. That is the least important thing, perhaps, about her bio, but is the most important to me. And I will tell you, she was a terrific boss. Um, she has also been uh, an uh, extraordinary leader at Harvard University, about which uh, one could say a great deal. Um, she is incidentally the first woman to serve as the president of Harvard University. Um, she is also a renowned historian of the Civil War and of the American South. Uh, her most recent book, This Republic of Suffering, Death, and the American Civil War, won the Bancroft Prize in 2009, was a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize, and was named by the New York Times one of the 10 best books of the year in 2008. And it continues to reverberate through uh, the historical community and also the public community in terms of a way to think about the Civil War. 
I wanted just to read to you something I've been boring people with all night because I love this story so much, but I want to read to you one sentence which will tie perhaps uh, um, President Faust's book to our, uh, our very space. Um, in uh, a, a chapter about halfway through the book, uh, President Faust writes, After Uncle Tom's Cabin, the best-selling book of the 19th century was Elizabeth Stuart Phelps's book, The Gates Ajar. And for those of you who have a sense of place right now, I want you to know that you are between Stowe House, which is about 100 yards this way, which the Elliots live in, which is Harriet Beecher Stowe's home, of course, um, and where uh, the, it's possible that the Uncle Tom's Cabin was written, but certainly uh, it was anchored there, and Phelps House, which is Elizabeth Stewart Phelps' house just across the street where the Gates Ajar almost certainly was written. Um, and so we are in a very special place, I think, between the two best-selling books written by two extraordinary women of the 19th century and then chronicled by um, one of the most extraordinary women of the 21st century, Drew Fast. Rick and Drew, thank you so much for being here. We're delighted to have you here to host this event. Thank you. here and to sort of share a little bit of the film that Drew and I worked on based on her book. Um, and John, as you said, to be in this particular spot is particularly resonant. Um, Drew and I have sort of talked about this over the last couple of years in public spaces. This is the furthest north that we've ever been. Um, <laughs> the cockpit of the Civil War tends to be thought of as Virginia, which, um, Drew's home state. But I'm made to think of Lincoln's comment about Harriet Beecher Stowe when he said of her when he first met her, so you're the little woman who began this great war. Um, and there's a sense in which for, for Americans, the entire country was so carried up and carried under by that war. And it's remarkable to be here and feel the resonance, and this is particularly one year after Boston, the resonance of this event 150 years ago. Um, you know, I, in reading Drew's book, I feel it is possibly the best book of the last generation on the Civil War. Um, it's one that returns us to the events 150 years ago and reminds us that sometimes the most important thing about history is that you have to sort of slow down and revisit the things you know. Not so much learn the things you, you know, don't learn things you don't already know, but go back to the things you do know things that you may have forgotten about, or the things that you may think you know so well that you haven't really caught the real nuances of. And Drew did an amazing thing in her book. She revisited the most hoary and revisited um, event in American history, the Civil War, and revisited the most central datum about the war, um, the fact that it killed a lot of people, two, possibly 3% of the population, um, maybe, maybe as many as 750,000 people. And she managed to, in directing our attention back to something we knew in a way that slowed down our attention and really caused us to focus in on it, um, did something that was, for me, kind of revolutionary and transformative. And I'm so proud of having been able to work on this film here with you. It's really been kind of the experience of a lifetime. We thought what we would do tonight is show you the introduction to the film. It's a two-hour film called Death in the Civil War, which is the subtitle um, of Drew's book, This Republic of Suffering. Um, and then sort of have a conversation first between ourselves and then open it out to any questions uh, that might have been provoked in you by this extraordinary work Drew undertook in which my colleagues and I sort of endeavor to follow on your footsteps. So thank you very much for having us and coming. And Mike, if you could roll that clip and play it as loud as possible. Thanks. Something that when people get it in their bloodstream once, they tend to get it again and again. 
Can you hear me now? Um, you know, my brother Ken and I did a series on the Civil War 20 years ago or so. Tonight, Ken has a film about the Gettysburg Address coming out. Having worked on the Civil War with him then, I revisited it with you. Your whole career has been kind of stitched in and out of the Civil War. So here we are, 150 years later, um, in front of a crowd of many, many young people um, for whom the Civil War is going to be very remote. Why the hell is this so important? Is it important? Or is it just sort of part of what Michel Foucault called the kind of the guild of historians who are part of the Freemasonry of useless knowledge who are just interested in it because it happens to be there. But I mean, nevertheless, if we weren't just kind of wasting our time, what is it, what makes this so compelling such that 150 years later, it's worth pushing aside, for a moment at least, more recent memories, all the things that compete with our, our attention, our daily lives, and say, this is really not the past. It's still somehow resonant in the present. Past is never dead, Faulkner. Uh, Rick, you asked this question, and I think about the journey that we've been on with this film over the past couple of years since you completed it. And Rick and I were on the battlefield at Antietam on the day of the observance of the 150th anniversary of that bloodiest battle day in American history. We uh, spoke at Gettysburg on the eve of the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. And as we've gone through this couple of years of talking about the war and talking about its meaning, what struck me is the way it's so resonant with themes that occupy us today. The remarks at the end of this clip about what does a citizen owe the state? What does the state owe to a citizen? What is the government? As we were headed off to Gettysburg last fall, the government shut down. And I thought to myself, all these people died and you can't even keep the government open? And it seems to me that the Civil War gives us this important inheritance for what was lost, what was sacrificed, what people committed themselves to in such extraordinary numbers and with such extraordinary dedication. I find it so remarkable to be here on the eve of the 150th, almost the eve of the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Spotsylvania, which was the battle in which so many people from this town died. It was the most bloody experience for Andover. And here is a town miles away from the site of the conflict. It's not the battle of Ant battlefield of Antietam, but it was a battlefield for so many families here who had to grapple with the level of loss that John described, just about the equivalent of the nationwide statistic of um, a little over 2% of, of the population dying. So it seems to me that the Civil War asks us again and again, what are you as a nation? What does it mean to be a nation? What do you owe the nation? And Rick, you talked about your earlier Civil War with Ken and the making of the series in the early 90s. I grew up in Virginia, and so the Civil War was a constant in my childhood. But the most dramatic earlier Civil War for me was the centennial observance in the 1960s when what was being refracted through our Civil War conversation was the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. What do we owe to one another? What does citizenship mean? What does equality mean? Why did we all die if we're still gonna have a segregated society? So I think the Civil War comes back and asks us these questions about the fundamental commitment we have to the nation and the fundamental definition of that nation for which this war was, was fought with such, such um, dedication and such loss. You know, the theme of your book, um, Death and the Civil War, um, someone could be forgiven for thinking that a relatively gloomy person um, was attracted to that subject. And I was just wondering, it's a question I've really never quite asked you, where was the moment, in what part of your own research and work as a historian, where death, this, you have a wonderful phrase for it in your book, the work of death. The work that Americans, whether they were the people dying or killing or burying or trying to account for, 
um, or honored after the war. That the work individually and collectively of death is this amazingly massive and encompassing experience. When did you come to see death, not just as this sort of spectral, spectral grim reaper, which it obviously is, but as something which is tremendously generative and part of how people really, it made them behave differently and do things differently. Was there a moment where you went, you know what, we say 620,000 died or 750,000 deaths. What moment did that word death come back to you and kind of grab, sneak up from you, on you from behind and ask you to think about the war in what is really a remarkably new way? I think I was drawn into this subject by an earlier project that I worked on, which was a study of um, slaveholding women of the South. And when I read during the war, and when I read their diaries and letters, I was struck by how often what they were writing and talking about was death, rather than the themes that are central to most writing on Civil War history. And so it was listening to them and really trying to see the war through their eyes, and then thinking about this extraordinary number. And at that point, the estimate was 620,000. Some recent demographic work has suggested it's more like 750,000, which for me just underscores even more dramatically the kinds of um, perceptions that this film and the book have. But when I thought of that extrapolation to our own time, seven million people dead, how could we as a society possibly experience something like that without being changed in every detail? So that's what really arrested my attention and made me think that it was a subject worth looking at in much more detail than had been the case previously. Everything from what on earth do you do with all those bodies to how do you continue to believe in God when you see this kind of evil and slaughter? But Rick, your question makes me think about something else as well, which is what I love about history is I see myself differently when I see the past making uh, different assumptions from the ones we make today. And I, I find myself asking, well, why do we feel the way we do about things when they felt the way they did? And what struck me in my journey into 19th century death was how we as a society hide death, try not to talk about death, um, there have been those who say it's the real pornography to talk about death in our society. Whereas in the 19th century, the belief was that you needed to think about death all the time because only then could you live your life to the fullest. So the presence of death or the awareness of death was not meant to make you gloomy. It was meant to make you aware of the finitude of life and to cherish that finitude and use that finitude. And so in that sense, I began to think of death differently as a result of listening to, to the way the 19th century incorporated it into so much of how it approached the meaning of existence. What do you think is most different today about the way we fight our wars and our attitude towards death? Um, I mean, the Civil War mobilized and engaged so many, such a huge percentage of the population, both civilian and you know, the 31 million people in America, you know, two to three million were actually fighting, 10% were caught up in it, the entire South was obviously caught up in it by the time of Antietam and Gettysburg, the North was understanding it was not a foreign war at all. Um, we don't kind of fight wars the same way. We don't have in, in 2014 the same intimacy or proximity to the realities of warfare, even though the forms of media we have seem to bring it very near it feels much more remote than those photographs of the dead at Spotsylvania or Antietam or Gettysburg, some of which we saw in that little clip, which seems to me sort of strangely more sort of closer to the public that was viewing it then and even to us now than those men and women who paid the partial or ultimate price on battlefields in Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah, what's really changed in your view over time? Well, it is part of the answer to to your question, so such a small percentage of our population is involved with the military, that it is not something that is expected of every citizen. It's less than 2% of the families in the United States that have family members who are involved in the military. So we can compartmentalize our wars in a way that was not possible to do in the Civil War, as Andover so powerfully represents. Despite its distance from the front, 
the war took place here in the families of, of those who lost their loved ones. So is that, is that part of what's so different? And the question I would ask is, can you imagine a war today for which so many Americans would be willing to fight? Would we be able to mobilize armies of this size for what cause? Well, it's so striking how in so many respects the Civil War was the most creative and inventive of our wars, the first American war which involved national conscription. So it was the first war in which the federal government said, you have a responsibility as a citizen to go and fight and die for your country. Previously, it had been professional armies, and the armies mobilized had been so much smaller. So in that respect, the Civil War really was the first war, which is what Marsh and and you as well in the introduction to the film are saying. That it's the war that defines citizenship mm -hmm. as being willing to fight and die mm -hmm. for your country. So, Rick, let me ask you as you think about your different civil wars, the Civil War of the 1990s when you did the series, and then making this film, and then following this film through the sesquicentennial, is there a different war now for you than there was two and a half years ago when you finished this film as a result of the conversations we've had? in the various places we've talked about it. Is this a different war from the 1990s war that was part of the original You know, I feel very, very much story. so. I mean, I feel that for me, um, as kind of an amateur film historian, um, that I've kind of lived through these two iterations, once in the late 80s when Ken and I worked for five years in this series, 12 hours long, which came out in the fall of 1990. Um, and now again, sort of 20 years, 20 years later. And what really, the, the thing that's changed most, is I think as you started to put your finger on it, is that even in 1985 or 1990, we were much closer to a generation that was um, filled with the exhilaration quite properly, and how could we not have been, of the sense of the advances made in civil rights in this country. Um, so the 60s and the 70s were not that far in the past. And I think that there is that way in which the Civil War was, for people thinking about it in the 1980s, caught up with the narrative of emancipation, as well it should be, and that should never be forgotten. But it, it was your colleague David Blight who pointed out there are all these narratives, whether it's about emancipation or the sometimes somewhat triacly reconciliation, North and South, each side fought bravely, let's forget what the differences are. Maybe the narrative is hideously the narrative of white supremacy. Whatever narrative you put on the war, in fact, you kind of distance yourself from this brutal existential reality, which is what was it doing to people? What was it like to be in that circumstance? What was it like to lose so much of our population? Or to die? Of? And I was really struck by there was a, a character who, who not at all, sadly, is an Andover character, Sullivan Ballou, um, a major in a reg regiment, an Andover graduate, who featured very prominently in our series. He was the, his words, you know, the night before the battle letter that he wrote to his wife, Sarah, is a kind of a legendary letter in American Civil War historiography for its tenderness, for how deeply emotional it is, um, how much it evokes his love of his family and his two boys, who in the end he never saw again, um, as he was carried off by these sort of unbreakable chains to the battle to fight this war, which he felt enormous patriotism and enormous longing for her and the boys. And of course, a week later he dies, he dies at the Battle of Bora. And the first episode of the film that my brother directed ended with that letter. And it was a very powerful kind of film experience. And if things had gone viral in 1990, that letter did the equivalent of It did it totally, everybody knew it. There was, it was no everybody, viral. There was no viral then, imagine that. Um, but everybody knew that letter and spoke. But here's the thing, we did not, what didn't we talk about in talking about Sullivan below his letter and his death? Well, he died at first bull run um, in July of 1861. Um, he was out in front of his men on a horse. We didn't mention any of the actual circumstances of his battle experience. He was hit in the leg, which ripped most of it off by a cannonball, which killed his horse instantly. We didn't mention that. He was essentially mortally wounded. Um, he was carried into not a pristine army field hospital, because there was no army medical corps, there was no ambulance corps. He was evacuated in a helter-skelter way to a church on the battlefield of Manassas, 30 miles from, from Washington, D.C. He was labored over. The Confederates overran the position. The Union Army famously routed from Bull Run left, leaving Sullivan Ballou, where he died at that church. 
Um, they had buried him in a very shallow grave. The Confederate forces which took over that ground desecrated the grave, decapitated Sullivan Ballou, mutilated his body. And the remains that are interred to this day with his wife Sarah, to whom he had written this tender letter, are sort of um, notional remains. There are some ashes and bits of bones that people think or hoped after the war might actually have been parts of Sullivan. And it was striking to me that I found that, that out in working on your film, not in working on our film. That that kind of the texture grappling with the business end of death, and killing, and dying, and war. And the fact that there was no ambulance corps, there was no system of burial, that his body was never fully recovered. Mm -hmm. And how that's really what lingered for Sarah, his wife. Not necessarily the words, the tender words he wrote, that sense of doubt and loss and incomplete mourning and a sort of a permanently open phantom limb, which was, mm -hmm. are these really the parts of my husband left on the ground? And so what I found in my own experience, um, sort of 20 years apart, of these two visitations to the scene of the Civil War was one which was <coughs> plausibly jubilant and celebratory of what it accomplished. And then the second, I found far different. And taking me, as I think your book does, into things which are much more unreconciled and unreconcilable and harder, and that that's a better place to be. And I was wondering if you felt that in the course of your own career as a, as a historian and a Civil War historian specifically, that you're drawn to those things which you can't kind of tie up in a neat bow, or say, and here is the moral of our story. Maybe that equipped me to be president of Harvard, I just can't get tied up in a neat bow, excuse me. Um, I'm thinking about uh, what Rick just said about Sullivan Ballou and his wife's distress and uncertainty about his fate, actually, and whether she had recovered his body or not. And it strikes me that we need to understand the late 19th century in a very different way if we have that view of the Civil War. Because if you think of the people living in Andover who lost loved ones, probably half of them, if it's statistically reflective of the rest of the nation, half of them wouldn't have been identified. The families would not have known, were they really dead? Might they show up one day? Were they in a prison camp? What had happened to them? And so how do you live with that? And doesn't that linger on for the rest of your life. So as we think about late 19th century history in the United States, I think we have to think of a nation in mourning and uncertainty and ask ourselves how much of what we look at in that period needs to be um, considered in the context of that loss and of people who had no uh, basis for what we today call closure in many cases because they didn't even know what had happened to their loved ones. So, it's made me revise my whole understanding of what came after the war. Appomattox, Reconstruction, that wasn't the end. It went on and it lingered in human ways for decades. So that's, that's one part of it. I guess the, another part of it for me is people have said to me after reading this book, so do you think the war shouldn't have been fought? And I say that isn't a question I need to address. That's not a question I'm asking. I do think when we decide for war, we need to know what it costs. And we need to understand in any situation where we as a nation decide we need to go to war, that this is what war is. And there are times when that is a decision that as a nation we would want to make. But if we hide from the realities of that, we are not using our democracy in the right way. We're not using our rights as citizens and our responsibilities as citizens in the right way. And I've been quite taken, and, and Rick, you've seen this in um, the response of people like Admiral Mullen. People in the military have been very interested in this book because they want the general public to understand what they're being asked to do when they go to war. And so this is an important part of our responsibility to our military as well as to our, our fellow citizens. So those are a couple of the things that, that have struck me about that impact of this and the unresolvability of it and yet the lingering lessons maybe that, that it can take.
I was wondering if for this audience, you might be able to, to pedagogue, extraordinaire that you are, put into one bundle, one very, what a kind of a capsule articulation. What it was that hit like a ton of bricks with the Civil War. We look back and we can't imagine having lived in an America that didn't have a Civil War. But nobody just before the Civil War thought they were going to have one. So we spend a lot of time in the years in the 150 years after, taming the Civil War, making it something which we understood had to have happened. We had to have resolved this conflict. We had to have freed four or five million Americans who were living as chattel slaves. But could you sort of evoke what it is that made the war so unimaginable, so unassimilable, so unpredictable, and therefore how, how enormously large it loomed in the experience of that generation itself. Because that's, I think, for me, that fact, that the war when it came was not what anybody expected. And it did hit them like a ton of bricks. And they had, it was like all bets were off. And they were in, not in Kansas anymore. And they had to, Americans had to figure out new ways of understanding the world they had very self-evidently brought into being for themselves, but it wasn't a world which, in early July 1861, before the first great battle, Bull Run, where Sullivan Blue, it wasn't a war anybody imagined was going to sort of fall down. What, how can you evoke? So that? John wants us to let people ask questions. Yeah, I'd love to hear your response, and if you'd welcome but some questions, I, um, Rick, I think in a way you. <coughs> You've posed the answer in posing the question, but I would just remind us that we're now about to start to observe the anniversary of yet another war, World War I, which so exceeded anybody's anticipations uh, about its cost and its duration and its viciousness. And isn't that something about war that it tends to surprise? People start wars thinking they can control them and, and accomplish set goals, and wars almost always turn out to exceed the ability and expect to control and meet the expectations of those who want them. And that's, that's perhaps a lesson here, too. Drew and Rick, would you welcome some questions in, from the audience? And Ashley, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Ashley, I'm a 10th grader from Southern Virginia, actually. And I was wondering if you could talk more about, I guess, slaves in relation to death in the Civil War. It's, it's something that you brought up in the film, but you haven't talked about. I think that's a really great question, the, the sort of the relationship of, of slaves, you know, African Americans, enslaved African Americans to this whole question of death in the Civil War. We treated it in the film um, sort of briefly, but I think there was a way in which, um, first of all, the experience of death was so much more common and so much more part of the familiar toolkit of experience for enslaved African Americans in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. I mean, you, there were myriad ways to die. And uh, the normal ways in which one assumes one has some control, it partially uh, enough control to keep death at bay. You have control over your body. You cannot be killed summarily without some kind of justice being visited on your murderer if he or she is caught. These were things not available to slaves. They could be moved, their quality of life was extraordinarily low. And so there's a way in which um, death was part of the ex ex existential repertoire of enslaved African Americans in a way that even at a time when mortality rates for the white population were much greater than them than now, um, for black Americans, it was all the greater. And then there was a way in which, what did it mean to be fighting and dying for your country? If you were an African American, North or South, during the Civil War, that meaning, the idea of what it was to give your life for your country, was something that was very, very different between African American Americans and non African American Americans at the time. So there was a way in which I think you might think of as white America caught up with an experience of mortality, which was tragically all too sewn in and written into the experience of African Americans. And as Lincoln himself in his second inaugural address, more than suggested, maybe this extraordinary stain of blood, an experience of blood, that's being visited on the country north and south, 
is a result, um, an inevitable, perhaps, consequence of having participated in the sin and stain of slavery, which is itself so much an experience of death, or at least, um, as one of, one of the remarkable historians we talked to in the film, Vincent Brown from Harvard said, if not actual death, the sort of the, the kind of the, the, the civic death, the civil death that is involved with not really owning yourself, what does that mean? What kind of sort of foreshortened experience of selfhood is involved when you don't have the basic legal rights extended to other people? So I think that there is a way in which this, it's not a theme, this central experience was one in which the non-African American population was catching up at last with the African American population. Just one set of particular facts that I had no idea of until I started doing this work. You may remember in the, towards the end of the clip, there's a picture of an African American with a kind of trolley of, of skulls. He was digging up and reburying um, dead Union soldiers who had just been scattered and left without graves. He was there about a year after the battle that had killed those people. At Spotsylvania. At Spotsylvania. And one of the um, realities that that represents is the fact that most of the work of death, if you mean burial squads and then those who reburied the dead and moved them into national cemeteries after the Civil War, was done by African Americans. And so they were the grave diggers of the Civil War and those who formed burial parties in many instances. And so, so much of that work was actually done by African Americans. And finally, emancipation itself as a political reality was driven by the number of dead white soldiers and by the fact that um, the Union High Command from Lincoln on down knew they had to find some other population to uh, begin to draft into service. And so initially, the Emancipation Proclamation was not, famously, it was not about freeing all African Americans. It was essentially a military necessity to make available more troops, in this case, black troops. And what you found is that after January 1st, 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, is not only did African Americans flood off the plantations from the South, they sort of embraced this new possibility, but there was this extraordinary clamor for African Americans to be allowed to not only be part of the army, but not to be part of the garbage detail, not to be part of the burial detail, but to, be, to wear uniforms and to carry weapons and to actually go into battle and fight and die for the cause which was so centrally um, transforming their lives. So the emancipation itself was absolutely a military necessity and had to do with putting African American troops in harm's way. Say there are no dumb questions. That was obviously a very good question. Actually, you listed a lot. Brian, step on up and please introduce yourself. Hello, um, I'm Brian McGuigan. I am an author from Andover, Massachusetts. So I was wondering if, uh, if you could talk about how your research into death and civil war specifically, um, how that's shown you anything about the evolution of hatred in the national con uh, consciousness, and especially how that changed um, as people saw. As people saw their loved ones dying, and as this huge population. That's such a great question, and, and probably the embodiment of the best answer to it is thinking about Gettysburg, and how at Gettysburg, Lincoln took the opportunity to define the purpose of the war and the purpose of all the death that had um, been experienced up until 1863. There was going to be that much death again, so um, his words have to be especially powerful in order to drive the nation through um, through that level of loss. But his commitment, these dead shall not have died in vain. This war has to be about something bigger than just a nation. It has to be about a new nation, a rebirth of freedom. So one can find other writings that take up this theme of with all these dead, we really have to commit ourselves to a nation that is of the highest ideals and that deserves the losses that have been encountered and, and experienced in this behalf. So I think death becomes an engine of patriotism. This is a very special nation because we have let it cost us so much, and therefore we owe it to make it special as we have determined it to work. And so I think the two are very closely tied. The cost and the value of the nation get 
Thank you. You'll be surprised that an hour goes quite so quickly, but could we do three more questions since there are three people standing? That'd be okay. I'm Bianca, I'm from Alexandria, Virginia, mm -hmm. um, and I'm the upper. Um, sort of along the same lines, I was just wondering what changes um, the sort of idea of death um, sort of made philosophically and socially, like any specific changes that you feel that would not possibly have had the same effect had all this death or not occurred. Um, You know, I think the thing I learned, Drew, from your book was, in a way, some version, however incomplete, of an answer to that question. Um, that somehow death was the preserve of individuals and their families, and maybe the group of people who lived in their towns before the Civil War. And the work of death through your book, I think, has shown so many things. It was the work of communities and families and individuals. And we did not think of the work of death as being the work of the country, either philosophically or patriotically, or in the way the government defined its role. It simply was there, you cannot go anywhere in America and find a revolutionary war cemetery. There's no federal revolutionary war cemetery the way there's a Gettysburg cemetery or an Antietam cemetery. And your focusing on the Gettysburg Address seems to be the crucial transitional moment where not exclusively, but in these ringing 272 words, the President of the United States said, we are a country now for, forged and founded on so many dead. And it is not the responsibility alone of grieving mothers, wives, sisters, brothers, fathers to, to take care of these dead, to wash their bodies, take them home, see them into the ground, cry sad tears over them. But it's our responsibility. That's the reason we're here at Gettysburg in November of 1863, to do this totally newfound thing in America to consecrate a cemetery, as they were doing in late November 1863, right outside the town of Gettysburg, where so many people had fought. What's the number? 8,000 in three days dead? 22,000 wounded? To, to do this new thing, to have a federal cemetery saying, we here, it's our duty to living. The government of the United States and all of us gathered here to say, we are going to remember them. We are going to honor them. We're going to put these boys into the ground. It's not going to be the job only of their local pastor, their mothers, wives, all of them, brothers, fathers, etc. And I was thinking, Drew, in a way, is that one of the biggest changes? We, we went from being a local country where we all lived in localities, even if we knew we lived in some place called America. And then for the first time, the nation state took on this incredibly intimate responsibility. I regret to tell you, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, your child is dead and died in the service of his country or now dead. Your daughter is dead. Do you and this, feel that? Yeah, and I would say this changes the nation state because in order to do this work, it has to have a bureaucracy, it has to have powers, it has to grow. It has to have a different understanding of what it owes the widows and orphans, so we get a pension system. So this whole elaborate set of structures emerges, which is the new nation state federal government. And that comes out of, really, the assumption of responsibility for those who've lost their lives. So it's not just the establishment of a set of responsibilities. It's the establishment of a whole different kind of understanding of what government is. And that's something we're fighting over right now as we say, should the government have all these responsibilities that have, it has assumed in the 20th century, or should it reverse some of those? So it's very much a live issue, but it's one that I think was born in that moment of the government becoming the nation state of power and responsibility that the taking care of the Civil War did require.
it was Vince Brown in the film again that historian who pointed out that every year today, this year 2014, next year 2015, the federal government will spend $100 million looking for the missing in action from World War II, the Korean War fought in the 1950s, and the Vietnam War. $100 million every year. And every American assumes that's, of course, the responsibility of the federal government. But the town of Andover, the state of Michigan where I grew up, no. There's only one structure large enough and resourceful enough to be able to even contemplate undertaking that mission. That was completely unthinkable before the Civil War. It would never have happened before the Civil War if the government would have said, we're going to expend federal tax dollars looking for and repatriating the remains of the missing election. And it's this very stark before and after. I mean, it just didn't happen before 1865. And now it happens. And we all Americans take it as the signal duty, the counterpart obligation. It is the obligation of the citizen to die for the country under certain circumstances, and that defines citizenship. Statehood is the unbreakable obligation of the state to bring the bodies home and to notify next of kin. It's a huge transformation. I mean, philosophical, bureaucratic, but an absolute watershed in the way governments think of what their responsibilities to their people it comes to us from the civil war. Okay, thank you. How could that have affected the American society as a whole for, say, I don't know, spent 30 years after the war? And how did that maybe stall America in a way? How did it, because, I mean, you're losing so, so many numbers in such an such a important generation at that time. So, you know, this is a really excellent question, and it's something that um, historical demographers are continuing to study right now and try to identify to what extent were there increases in the number of women who never married or women who were widowed and left destitute and how do we understand the, the numbers of 
I think your question is one that's still very much under discussion and analysis. But um, I think part of it is that there was a considerable portion of the white southern um, male population that was either destroyed by the war or so psychologically damaged by the war and the expectations of victory that were shattered that it, it really had an effect on that society for many years to come. And so that's one of the big questions that I think we all need to understand better as we think about the United States from 1865 until the day we So it's a great Thank you, great. Thank, thank you for a wonderful final question. Um, Drew and Rick, we've held you longer than an hour, but I wonder if there's anything, last thoughts on your mind that you were hoping that you might be able to say tonight in Andover and, um, and have a last word and then I'll say a final thank you. Well, I, I just want to say thank you for being here and how moved I am to think of being in this town with Harriet Beecher Stowe on one side and Elizabeth Stewart Phelps on the other the memories and ghosts of the families who lost so many men here from Andover and thinking about the Civil War. In the words, actually, I think of, of the prologue to your 1990 series, which is the Civil War took place in 10,000 10, places. And that's something we need to remember because it took place in the hearts and families and lives of millions of individuals. And so when we bring it down to the local and the individual, we can see how these large themes build on this, this kind of individual experience and, and amplify the poem. So being here for this has, has been very meaningful to me. Thank you. I second that and I would just say that, you know, here we are in year three of the cycle of sesquicentennial remembrance of the Civil War, which began in 2011, 150 years after 2015. So we're going to, obviously we're not constrained to remember history only at particular symbolic markers at the 50th or the 100th or 150th, but there's been a lot of individual and collective energy spent in the last few years because it is the 150th and because of our love of numerology and symmetry. And I would say that, you know, I kind of got into the history dodge accident. Um, I originally thought I was going to be a professor of English. Um, and I'm so glad I did. And it makes me think, being here tonight, how you know, it's not, none of us have to know anything about history. We don't have to know it. It's, you don't, it's not going to tie your shoe in the morning. It's not going to necessarily um, be the way you make money. Um, you can go through your life entirely unaware of history. And I feel so incredibly blessed, Drew, to have been brought into a life that's allowed me to think about history. Um, because, and it's what I want to sort of leave you with as a form of exhortation, that it's a voluntary activity, like pinochle or tennis. <laughs> but it's one, and it's one which, like pinochle and tennis, your life can go on entirely without it. But the amazing thing is how whether you know it or not, we call them ghosts in some fanciful metaphorical way, but they're not really ghosts. These realities, from Harriet Beecher Stowe to the Phelps house down the street, are crowding around us, whether we know it or not. And the extraordinary richness and be even beauty, um, and also the sense of possibility and wonder that comes from knowing even just a few things about them. Um, have been so enriching even to me as an amateur historian. So I just want to say, if you think that, if you think for a second this stuff is, is a game not worth the candle, think again. Because it tends to be a self-confirming proposition. The more you look into it, the more you visit or revisit these moments as we are now, this kind of extraordinary moment in American history, the more it resonates in your life individually and collectively, and the more it explains and shows and sheds light. So I sort of feel a kind of sense of anticipatory poignancy and sorrow that the sesquicentennial is going to come to an end. <laughs>
projects that are good to tromp around the future. <laughs> they will make another film and create that connection. But just to say, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be another 150 years between, before the next sesquicentennial of the Civil War comes. Don't wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I should, I should let, leave those as the last words, but I did want to say, um, Add a few of my own, just just by way of thank you. Um, uh, there are many ways to describe the presidency of Drew Faust at Harvard um, as a leader in the arts, as a leader more recently in climate change, having made amazing natural science and social science statements, and recently setting up a task force to look at sexual violence on campus. There are many things that you've done to lead Drew, but one is to create the notion of one university and to prompt all of us, whether we were in a professional school or in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, to bring together multiple lenses on the same interesting and hard problems. Um, and I experienced that as a faculty member and as a, as a student, but I actually think it was wonderful to see you two do it tonight. I don't think there's anything amateur about your historianship, I have to say, Rick, um, but certainly to see the way in which a process that must have taken you many years in archives, Drew, to produce this extraordinary book, then recreated as a film that we all got to experience and then to hear you from multiple perspectives to retell this story. I think this is a wonderful example of the power of multiple forms of scholarship coming together um, to make something uh, become deeply alive. And Rick, for you to end exactly as you did, um, I think in a wonderful exhortation, uh, both to the townspeople of Andover, but to the students of the school, um, to think about this as a lifelong process of understanding the extraordinary and hard topics that you brought up. Death, of course, on its, on its face, but citizenship, race, um, uh, relations between the genders, a whole host of things that we grapple with every day in these extraordinary ways you have brought to us in such a rich way this evening. I am deeply, deeply grateful, and on behalf of all of us, please join me in thanking everyone. <laughs>